This is important. And if you go away with anything today, I want it to be this. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Only on Jesus. He's the originator and perfecter of faith. What does that mean? That means that all faith starts and finishes with Jesus. Welcome to the Reach College Podcast with your guest speaker, Cameron Sears. Good morning. My name is Cameron. Hi, Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's been a while since I've been here. I've been serving in the seventh grade Sunday school for the past year, so it's good to be back. Um, so, yeah, I'm excited to teach. I'm going to say a prayer real quick. I know we just prayed, but I want to pray again. So, Dear God, I thank you for this morning, and I thank you for your word. Um, Lord, I just pray that uh, we know your word is living and active. Um, I pray that you would just soften all of our hearts to receive from you, and that we would submit to what you say is true. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So... This is a little dark and dismal for a Sunday morning, but stick with me. David, a two-year-old with leukemia, was taken by his mother, Deborah, to Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston to see Dr. John Truman, who specializes in treating children with cancer and various blood diseases. Dr. Truman's prognosis was devastating. He said he has a 50-50 chance. The countless clinic tests, the blood tests, the intravenous drugs, the fear and pain. The mother's ordeal can be almost as bad as the child's because she must stand by, unable to bear the pain herself. David never cried in the waiting room. And although his friends in the, in the clinic had to hurt him and stick needles in him, he hustled in ahead of his mother with a smile, sure of the welcome he always got. When he was three, David had to have a spinal tap, a painful procedure at any age. It was explained to him that because he was sick, Dr. Truman had to do something to make him better. If it hurts, remember it's because he loves you, Deborah said. The procedure was horrendous. It took three nurses to hold David still while he yelled and sobbed and struggled. When it was almost over, the tiny boy, soaked in sweat and tears, looked up at the doctor and gasped. Thank you, Dr. Truman, for my hurting. And I thought that story was um, uh, important because it shows that this kid who was going through so much suffering and had no reason to um, uh, still have joy, to um, it was very difficult for him to trust what was going on, hardly had any idea what was going on. Um, this kid still understood that the suffering he was going through was ultimately for his good. And he trusted the doctors. He trusted his parents that it was because of their love for him that he had to go through the pain. So today we're going to be talking mostly about faith. And I want to set a, a clear definition of what that is um, because I've been learning a lot about it lately and uh, what it truly means. So, Let's get one thing straight. Faith is not just believing without evidence. That is um, a typical definition you might hear from from a dictionary from the world. Um, I believe that faith has two components. Uh, The first one is the object of faith. Uh, Hebrews 11.1 says, Faith is the certainty of things hoped for, a proof of things unseen. Faith is a certainty of things hoped for, a proof of things unseen. Now, at face value, that sounds like believing without evidence, but that's not what it means. It says faith is the certainty of things hoped for. Well, what are we hoping for that we're certain of? Our worldview is that we believe in God's Word and the things God's Word says. So, uh, we are called to believe God's Word. And what does God's Word say? It says things like God created the heavens and the earth. He created man male and female, and he, uh, it says that uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and one son, that whoever believes in him 
will not perish but have eternal life. Um, and it says all have uh, fallen short of God's glorious standard. And things like that. That's our worldview. The second component of faith is the action of faith. James 2.17 says, In the same way, faith also, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. So faith must always produce action. Because what is that verse saying? It's saying, your words, you're telling me that you believe this, but you got nothing to show for it. If you say you believe in God's word and you're showing no fruit, no fruits of the Spirit, um, then how are we to believe? How are you to even be confident that you truly have faith in God? So these things work in tandem together, the object of faith and the action of faith. A simple way to put it that Pastor Nick Dyer told me a few weeks ago is that faith is acting upon the Word of God. In fact, write that down if you're taking notes. Faith is acting upon the Word of God. And sometimes we overcomplicate it. Now the world will tell you that faith is foolish and that you believing in, in God and higher power is, is fairy tale stuff and um, you know we, we we believe in reason instead. That's that's sometimes how people will put it. Um, but you'll find that having an atheistic worldview requires just as much faith, if not more, than uh, as the Christian faith. The only difference is the object of faith. So the object of faith in our case is that uh, we believe in, in God's word. That's our worldview. And the uh, worldview and object in the atheistic case is that Everything came from nothing, for no reason, and there is no moral objective standard. One of these leads to everlasting peace, a relationship with God, our Creator, and the other leads to chaos and moral chaos. Yeah. But um. Anyways, the title for um. No. Yes. Okay. Yet even as Christians, we struggle to have faith when we hit stumbling blocks. So we have the object of faith in God's word. Uh, we have the action of faith, but even still, we hit bumps in the road. So the title for today's sermon is Jesus' Example of Faith Empowers Us to Persevere Against Sin. We'll be reading in Hebrews chapter 12. So if you're not already there, that's where we're reading. Little context for the book of Hebrews. Um, the author of Hebrews is anonymous. We don't know exactly who wrote it, but uh, we can tell it was most likely someone like Paul or Barnabas. Uh, Taylor said it was Apollos. I trust Taylor, so we'll go with that. Um, and the date uh, that it was written was uh, before uh, 64 AD, because we know that um, this was written before there was serious. Um, persecution of this community of believers that um, this letter was written for. The audience is um, Jewish believers. This was written to Jewish believers who had converted to Christianity upon hearing the gospel, upon uh, believing in Christ, who upon seeing the signs of oncoming persecution wanted to abandon the way of Christ and revert back to old Jewish practices. The whole book is an exhortation or an encouragement and call to Jewish believers doubting their conversion. The author argues that Jesus' sacrifice is the only way to be right um, with God, to be in right standing with God, and that the old sacrificial system and priesthood are insufficient and no longer needed to receive God's forgiveness. Simply put, Jesus is better. Jesus is better than the old way. Now we have this new way. Okay. A uh, large part of the book is dedicated to that, saying that Jesus is better than the old stuff. There's a large portion dedicated to faith, explaining what faith is, uh, what happens when you reject faith, which we know is ultimately judgment, um, and what happens when faith has been lived out in the Bible. But today we're going to be looking at Jesus, who was our perfect example of faith, whom we look towards as an example. Okay, so let's read. Starting in verse 1, 
Therefore, since we also have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let's rid ourselves of every obstacle and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let's run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking only at Jesus, the originator and perfecter of the faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So, this first part, therefore, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us. What's that referring to? Well, it's a reference to the chapter before, which listed what we call the Hall of Faith. A lot of uh, examples from the Old Testament of people who acted upon the Word of God. When God told them to do something, they obeyed. And in doing so, were counted as righteous. Um, <clears throat> that's people like Abraham, and Moses, and Joseph, and all those uh, that we read about in Genesis and beyond. Now, whether this refers to a literal spectatorship of faithful believers actually watching down on us and judging us, you know, that's not important. I don't know the answer to that. But the point is that we have more than enough evidence that God honors those who humbly put their faith in him, and we have every reason to walk in their footsteps. Now, the second part of that verse 1, let's rid ourselves of every obstacle and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let's run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now, what is the race that is set before us? It's the race that we should run with endurance. It's the Christian life. It's repentance. It's uh, obedience. You know, the greatest commandment that Jesus gave us is to love God and love others. Um, those are what we're called to do. Um, but what's the opposite of running the race with endurance? That would be falling flat on your face in sin. We are supposed to go and sin no more. That's what Jesus called us to do. But we continue to stumble. You go again and again to the things that think are going to bring us joy. We know it's not true. We know it's wrong, but we do it anyway. What is the answer to that? It says to strip off every weight, to let it go, to purge your idols. Now, what is an idol? An idol is anything that you place higher than God in your heart. So purge your idols, discontinue sinful practices. These are keeping you from growing in your intimacy with God. So what he's saying here aligns well with what Jesus said in Matthew 5, uh, 30. And if your right hand is causing you to sin, cut it off and throw it away from you. For it is better to lose one of the parts of the body than for your whole body to go into hell. Now, we always say that's extreme language, but he uses that language because it's serious. Nothing that is causing you to sin is worth keeping in your life. The author goes even further when he says, um, let's rid ourselves of every obstacle. Claiming if it's even a distraction from your walk with God, throw it away. It isn't worth keeping. You don't know the effect it has on your faith and your walk with the Lord. I'll give you a personal example. Um, I came to faith. I gave my life to Christ about two years ago. And along with that, God immediately convicted me of certain things that I needed to stop doing, you know, like video games and and um, social media. Those were things that um, I didn't put up much of a fight to give up. Um, and the enemy was okay with that. But the enemy's really good at finding the things that you're not willing to give to God and using those using that source to distract you from the prize, from keeping your eyes on the prize, which is Jesus Christ. So one thing for me that I put up a fight against was uh, secular music. I, um, I love music. I always have. I always will. Music is amazing. I think there's something euphoric and heavenly about it. Um, and it's good, unperverted it's good. It's created by God. But um, like all of creation under the curse of sin, it's tainted and can be used for wrong reasons. So um, I found myself often listening to things 
that were not inherently uh, uh, sinful in themselves, but were distracting me from my walk with God. Like, for example, I listened to like alternative bands, and I, I like the style of music, right? Okay, But the lyrics they're singing are not true. They're lies. And even if I'm not believing them, I'm still feeding them to myself. And that has an effect on my soul, whether I realize it in the moment or not. So what he's saying here is things like that, just throw it away. It's not worth keeping. Continuing on, let's read uh, verse 2 again. Looking only at Jesus, the originator and perfecter of the faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. This is important. And if you go away with anything today, I want it to be this. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Only on Jesus. He's the originator and the perfecter of the faith. What does that mean? That means that all faith starts and finishes with Jesus. The difference between our faith, you've heard Taylor say this before, our faith and that of believers in the Old Testament is that they looked forward to Jesus, to the coming Messiah, and we look back to him and the salvation that he gave us on the cross. This is why it was counterproductive for these Jews that the author was writing to to go back to Judaism because the Savior had already come. The debt for all sin for all time was paid when Jesus died on the cross. Abraham didn't know what God would do when he was told to sacrifice his son Isaac on the altar. But he acted upon the word of God because he believed God would fulfill his promise to make a nation from which he would produce a savior. Moses, who didn't know what God would do when he called him out of his life of luxury in Egypt, he was, you know, hanging out with kings, to lead the Israelites to the promised land. But it says in Hebrews 11.26, that he considered the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. And the Greek word used for reproach is translated to that of shared suffering with Christ. He considered the shared suffering with Christ greater riches. He had his eyes on Jesus Christ. So the author's point in this, in this book is that even the Israelite forefathers had their eyes on Jesus, though they didn't know him by name yet. So Christ has always been the point and always will be. All right, let's read on. Actually, verse 2 again. Looking only at Jesus, the originator and perfecter of the faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. We should set our eyes on Jesus to follow his example. He endured the worst that sin had to offer, but he was completely faithful. His faith was complete because he never doubted the Father's will, which led him to suffering and to death. The author posits that if we look towards Christ's suffering, and the fact that the Father kept his promise and gave him a priceless eternal reward, we should not give up the fight when times get difficult for us. It says, despising the shame. What does that mean? Despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. It means he saw to the end. He saw what, what, what faith proves. Now, remember, faith is not just believing without evidence. Jesus knew that God's word was true, and he knew that he would be raised to life and glorified, though his human eyes could not see it, because he chose to become like us. We are to imitate him. Now what does faith look like for us? We are to believe that even while we were still in sin, Christ died for us, paying our debt in full, and for that we owe him our lives. Following Jesus is a call to self-denial. We are to turn from our old ways to obedience in Jesus. We call that repentance. But the race we are to run with endurance is not easy. All right, let's read on verses 4 through 11. 
And that the point for this is the Father's discipline should lead us to faith. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood, and you're striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are punished by him. For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he punishes every son whom he accepts. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons, for what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems not to be pleasant, but painful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterward it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Okay, that's a lot, but... The age-old question that everybody asks at some point is why does God let bad things happen to good people? But that's not a good question because it's got a false premise. Uh, there are no good people. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Um, but if we are right in God's sight because of Christ's sacrifice, and we are, why do we still suffer? The fact is that God is disciplining us. He's training us. Though our spirits are made new in Christ, we still battle against our flesh. It says in verse 10, we just read, uh, But he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share his holiness. God cannot be in the presence of sin. It's not in his nature. Um, so he spends the duration of our lives refining us, so that we can be holy as he is holy. That's called sanctification. Um, just as a father disciplines a child with a rod to show that there are consequences to wrongful behavior, God lets us taste the pain of our sinful actions. But this is different from wrath and judgment. Um, God's wrath and judgment comes to those who reject him, who reject the faith, who do not, who do not act upon the word of God. Uh, this is loving and sanctifying for our good, this discipline, because it leads to correction and prevention of sin, which ultimately hurts us, which leads to greater intimacy with God, which is the point. Okay, our third point is that Jesus provides all strength needed to choose faith over sin. Let's read verses 12 through 13. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble, and make straight paths for your feet, so that the limb which is impaired may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Therefore strengthen your hands that are weak, and the knees that are feeble. This is permission to get up off the ground and get back to work. So often when we sin, we fall flat on our face, and we stay there. And um, the enemy is constantly telling you that because you sinned, which he tempted you to do in the first place, because you sinned, you're weak and hopeless, and you weren't meant to be a Christian, and you're not good enough. These are all just, just lies from the enemy. But 1 John 2, verse 1 says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. We have forgiveness because Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father, pleading for us, pleading for our case. He took our punishment on the cross, and now when the Father goes to judge us, we, or when our time comes, he only sees Jesus Christ. If we have acted upon the word of God and given our lives to him. Now the enemy wants you to stay broken and paralyzed. But the Lord's mercies are new every morning. Don't ever forget that. No matter how far you've sinned, Jesus always offers forgiveness, and his mercies are new every morning. 
They'll use that as motivation to get up. Now, Jesus wants you to obey him and act upon the word of God and be healed. Now, this is not a call to achieve perfection while on earth. That will never happen. The gospel is all about having intimacy with God. That's why Jesus died for us, so that we could be in right relationship with him again. And that's why I share this passage. I fall flat on my face and sin time after time after time again and again. But God is not satisfied to leave us there in our own mess. He will discipline us. And it is painful. But it is good. It is, it is for our good. And it's for his glory too. So he calls us to action and a purpose. Providing all the strength needed to act upon his word and obey him. Now, when we break up and get into pairs and discuss and pray with each other, I want us to discuss what sins or idols are keeping me from setting my eyes only on Jesus. Also, what does a straight path forward look like for me? An even more important question to ask is, am I sure about my relationship with God? Where do I stand? With the Savior. If you're not sure where you are, then the straight path forward for you is to hear the gospel and to accept it and believe it. Jesus died in your place for your sin, and He paid the exact debt that you owed. And if you openly confess that you believe in Him, if you act upon the Word of God in faith, and believe that he is your Savior, if you repent from your old way and turn to your new way, follow God, be in his word, be in an abiding relationship with Jesus Christ, then you'll be right with God, and you'll have peace that you've never had before. Hey guys, this is Philip Jackson, pastor of Young Adults at Evergreen Baptist Church. I want to invite you to come to Reach. We meet every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. at Evergreen Church in South Tulsa, just east of Mingo on 111th Street. The mission of Reach Tulsa is to cultivate a young adult community that's defined by real transformation and the sincere pursuit of a godly life through training in biblical disciplines, personal development, and intentionally transitioning into independence as mature members of the body of Christ. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to like and subscribe to our content. We're available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Reach Young Adult Ministry is a part of Evergreen Baptist Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. For more information and additional lessons, please visit our website, evergreenbc.org.